Hello, my name is Brooke Muzzy and this is Scouting on Air. Scouting on Air is the first official television program about the scouting movement today. Our show is produced by the Scouts of Oakland County, Michigan in partnership with local networks. On this month's episode, we are taking a look at Trail the Eagle, Cub Scout Day Camp, and checking out Avon's gumbo recipe, along with an exclusive interview with Dr. Harvey from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Thanks for joining us. First up, Anthony is giving us an exclusive look at Trail the Eagle. Trail the Eagle is set up on a premise that 28 years ago, that we wanted to keep older kids still in scouting, the 16, 17 year olds that were getting a job or a car, girlfriend or sports, and we wanted to keep them in so give them that extra little oomph to get their ego. Basically, that was set up on that premise. Trail Eagle is so unique. I mean, there is literally no other program, I, I, I don't think at least, that there are any other programs like ours because we have such a variety of things to do. One of the specialties is that all of our merit badge counselors are professionals. Firemen doing fire safety, policemen doing uh, whatever they do, uh, search and safety, and, and we have our own camp newspaper. But we have over 100 adults on our staff teaching all the required merit badges at Eagle, but we also had all these specialty things like aviation and like uh, horsemanship because we have our own horses here. Why should you choose Trail to Eagle? Um, really, it's a unique experience uh, for all scouts to be a part of. You know, it's offered from first class scouts and above, and it just really hits home getting merit badges just like any other summer camp but also just having fun in general. Like behind me, there's a volleyball game going on right now. It's just a skirmish, but we have activities like that going on almost all week. I think my favorite part about trail is like all the spirit and the cheerfulness and stuff, like meals, being able, especially as a jazz and being able to like lead the scouts and cheers and everything, plan, plan, uh, plan skits and stuff. And I've had a number of, especially moms, who would say to me, you know, I'm glad we, my son could do citizenship in the world, she said, but he said, the enthusiasm when you sent him back home to continue with leadership in our troop, leadership in our, our venture crew or whatever it may be, is phenomenal. Those kids would have quit a long time ago, but because of Trail the Eagle, they're just full of scouting spirit. And again, we have this philosophy and our philosophy is you got to believe. Next, let's check out what Yvonne is cooking today. Summer is halfway done, but this blazing heat does not mean that hot food should be completely off of your menu. Today, I'm bringing you chicken andouille gumbo, the best invention of Louisiana's Creole kitchen, straight from New Orleans. This gumbo is so fantastic, anybody who tries it will be thanking you for weeks and weeks on end about the fantastic cuisine they've tried. But enough about praising said gumbo, let's see the ingredients that go into it. First up, we're gonna have a pound or a pound and a half of chicken, followed by a pound to a pound and a half of hot sausage. This is gonna be the meat base for our gumbo, and that's where you get your highly important proteins. After that, we're gonna have some crushed tomatoes, two peppers, two sticks of celery, and an onion. This will make up the vegetable base for our gumbo, and will provide us with that much needed other nutrients. After that, we have some oil and flour to make the all important gumbo root. And lastly, we'll have some cornstarch to thicken up our gumbo from a soup to a more gravy-esque consistency. And lastly, we have some more herbs and spices which we'll add on as we go through our cooking process. Now the first step to making gumbo is also the longest step, but not because of difficulty, but sheer time. We're going to be simmering this chicken for about an hour to get it nice, soft, and tender to be ready to be added to our main dish. Like so.
And now we set it and forget it for the next 60 minutes. Moving on to cooking our next ingredients. Now while our chicken is simmering, we're gonna move on to the next part of gumbo and possibly the most important one, making the roux. What the roux is, is baking some oil to a nice hot temperature, as you can see now it's steaming. And we're gonna cook some flour. We're gonna bring it up to a nice brownish consistency and we're gonna bake all the air and the water out of said flour to reach a nice nutmeg flavor, which we'll use to enhance our gumbo taste. Now, it's very important to time the roux correctly because the bubbles that you saw is actually the water and the air evaporating from our flour. It's very important not to miss the point where the bubbles go away because that's when the most rapid part of the browning process happens. That's when the nutmeg comes out. But if you let it go too far, it's going to turn black and you're going to get a whole lot of burnt flavoring, which is not what we want to do here. It's supposed to reach a rich, dark brown coloring, but just before it actually burns. And so it's very important to watch your roux as you cook it. Now I just added the tomatoes and the sausage to our sauteed vegetables. This is gonna allow the sausage and the tomato paste to interact together and sap all the juices from the sauteed veggies and incorporate it into the paste and then work together with the hot sausage to bring out the spiciness in our gumbo. Now we let it cook for 10 minutes and then we simmer it for the next 40 until the chicken gets done. When the chicken gets done, we're gonna bring it out, mix it in cook it for another five minutes, and then we'll be done, and the gumbo will be ready to serve. And now for the spices. We're gonna add them after we added our sausage and tomato paste to the rest of the roux. And what it involves is about a teaspoon of each of the spices that's seen before. We're gonna need a teaspoon of cayenne, a little bit of dill, a teaspoon of sage, white pepper, oregano, black pepper, and two bay leaves, as any soup requires. And then we're also gonna need two teaspoons of salt. These flavors are gonna to work together to bring out a nice, rich, yet spicy flavoring to add on to the sausage and the tomatoes and the roux that's in our gumbo to make for a delicious eating experience. Here's what the end product should look like after simmering for 30 minutes. Bon appetit! Now let's see what Cub Scout Day Camp is all about. I just what I enjoy to see is that like everyone just have fun. Again, it's not too much. I mean, it's not that kids are like, you know, doing something specific or doing whatever they need to do right, activity, making a cardboard banjo the correct way. It's just like, as long as they're having fun, I'm happy. And uh, that's why I'm here helping today. What I like so much about it is when I went fishing because I actually almost caught a, um, I almost caught a catfish. Oh wow! I got, almost got, I almost caught it up and then it slipped right off.
So I came two years ago as a camper. Um, it was the same. I don't remember most of it because there's been a lot of stuff since then. But um, it was fun. It was fun. I remember Arts and Crafts. I think they're just getting a lot of fun memories and maybe a couple of skills like teamwork and bonding. Um, and I think they've had a lot of fun. So far, what's been your favorite part of camp? Making the table. What'd you like about it? I liked when we was trying. I like when I was getting made. <laughs> Have you ever come here before? Yes. What did you think of it? It was so, good. I think good. If we can avoid four on a. I'm looking forward to taking a nap when I get home because kids are tiring. Welcome back to Scouting on Air. Today I am interviewing Dr. Eleanor Harvey, who is a curator at the Smithsonian Museum. <laughs> uh, what do you do as a curator at the Smithsonian Museum? Mostly, what I'm doing is trying to find a way to make American art relevant to the general population while still researching ideas that I find really fascinating. Okay. Uh, what is your personal relationship with scouting? Since this is a scouting show, I'm very curious. This is a scouting show. Okay. If your folks can see me, uh, the landscape behind me is Philmont Scout Ranch in Cimarron, New Mexico. That is the tooth of time over my shoulder. Um, I had the privilege of uh, being a honcho on two treks with my son's Boy Scout troop in 2015 and 2017. Um, I grew up as a Girl Scout. Um, my daughter was a Girl Scout. My son is an Eagle. Um, and so my involvement is I got hornswoggled into being an assistant scoutmaster and running some of the high adventure programs that our scout troop, which is 106 in Arlington, Virginia, um, helps put together. Awesome. I personally went to Philmont. I had a great time. I did not get to climb the Tooth of Time, but it was beautiful. I did get to see it from a distance. Um, I tell you, um, it's an amazing experience being out there, and I think that kind of concentrated time in nature is one of the things scouting does best, where it brings out your resilience, your appreciation for the natural world, and your responsibilities for making sure that the world remains a place that is friendly to scouts and to others who want to explore the wilderness. I agree. I definitely, I remember being out there, and those views you couldn't experience through a photograph. It was no. one of a kind, and obviously we took pictures and look back on our memories, but yeah. when you wake up in the morning and you eat breakfast on the edge of a cliff watching the sunrise, mm -hmm. yeah. you'll, you'll never experience something like that again unless you go to Philmont again or another high adventure base. I remember the first morning at Deer Lake when I rolled out of my tent um, in the middle of the night, and there's the Milky Way. and. You know, I'm I'm here outside Washington, D.C., where the light pollution is such that there, there's no way you're going to see the Milky Way. You really have to be out somewhere with a dark sky. And I think the ability to understand sort of the magnitude of what the universe has to offer is something that binds everybody together, regardless of where you grew up. Um, there's something in scouting that really, um, I think, develops both the leadership skills that you need in uh, in modern society, but it also tests those skills in places that are still um, very much a, a, just a, a marvel to be a part of. Absolutely. How have natural spaces inspired the scouting movement and um, just American art in general? You know, it's interesting because we did something that a lot of cultures don't do. Um, the United States early on decided that rather than trying to build our way to international significance, 
Um, most European countries, um, their landmarks are the seven wonders of the world. It's uh, the pyramids, it's the Eiffel Tower, it's St. Paul's Cathedral, it's the Vatican. Well, we didn't have that, but um, the German explorer Alexander von Humboldt, who became best friends with President Thomas Jefferson, basically says to Jefferson, you have natural monuments, you've got Niagara Falls, you've got natural bridge, play to your strengths and make those the symbols of your country. And so that's where we started. And from there, every major expedition that went west from Stephen Long to Lewis, I mean, it was after Lewis and Clark, but from Stephen Long through the four great surveys of the American West, we came back with stories about the Great Plains, Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, and that became our version of the Grand Tour. Um, the National Park System is in fact those natural monuments that are set aside that we all take pride in. And for a lot of us who got dragged to vacations, whether it was at the South Rim of the Grand Canyon or up to Niagara Falls, may not have known it, but we were on a kind of pilgrimage to understand ourselves better. And so to me, scouting dovetails with that because it really is a journey about self-discovery and about awareness, both of your strengths, but also what you're capable of doing. The interesting thing about American art is that because landscape was the genre that essentially spoke to our cultural ambitions, landscape painting became the genre that did that the best. And so a lot of American artists from the 19th century to the present day have fanned out across the country and painted those places that either were of great personal significance or cultural and national exist, uh, uh, importance. And what's really great about that is that regardless of where you are, you can be on the UP in Michigan, you can be in the American Southwest, you can be in Okefenokee Swamp or in the Everglades, you can be in the Adirondacks or on the AT or on the Pacific Crest Trail. All of those landscapes are part of that American canon. And so for me, as someone who studies landscape painting, it's the combination of art and science and exploration that means that there's always something new to learn. There's always a room for restless curiosity. And there's always view for, room for that staggering view that just kind of stops you in your tracks. Absolutely. I've definitely, I've gotten to see some of the national parks. Just a couple months ago, I went to the Grand Canyon and it is marvelous. You, you see this, this slice through stone and you can see all the layers of sediment and everything like that and it's it's insane it's more incredible than anything man-made we could ever make so i you definitely know it's also it's sort of a cosmic history lesson mm -hmm. you know cutting through that much time realizing the power of water um realizing that that's basically the, sh the form that that that's the element that shapes so much of the entire globe um, it really does, I think, offer a classroom outdoors that, where you don't actually mind learning about those things and because it's something that sticks with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, where has scouting and art crossed paths in the past? You know, it's interesting because from the very beginning, Lord Baden-Powell was an amateur artist and he was always drawing and sketching. And although he tended to prefer caricatures, um, I think one of the things that that reminds us is in the 19th century, art and science and exploration, even just casual hiking, went hand in hand. Most of the artists actually learned how to paint the landscape by drawing outdoors. So that was their classroom. Um, they were viewed as kind of playing hooky, hanging out under the trees and sketching the views and taking naps and having a great time. It frankly sounded like a pretty good life. Um, and so from the very beginning, the idea of scouting as a way of developing, again, leadership skills and a sense of purpose in the world um, went hand in hand. There are people who have been involved in or have been advocates for scouting who are great outdoorsmen. Um, the people from the Boone and Crockett Club, the people who are the ones who have developed the kind of um, camping programs and high adventure programs that bring together both the best elements of scouting, but in places that have been memorialized by American artists as well. Um, I will say that, you know, you look at a lot of both American artists and photographers, 
And there are a number of them um, in this modern day that have been through the scouting movement and credit it with one of the things that helped them sort of develop the vision and the drive for their own careers. Um, so I think the dovetail is more than just an appreciation for the wilderness. It also really cuts to the notion of planetary stewardship. What is our responsibility to the planet? Not just what can we get from it and how much do we appreciate it, but what do we owe it back for our mutual and beneficial survival? Absolutely. Um, why is American art so valuable to American history? I think American art is really valuable to an understanding of American history because when we were founded, we didn't have much history. So, you know, in Europe, you have a proud tradition of paintings about mythology and religion, centuries of history going back to classical antiquity. We didn't have that. And so what we painted were our aspirations for the future. And in a lot of cases, we painted it in terms of a landscape that was meant to symbolize our, our confidence, our enthusiasm, and our aspirations to be successful. Um, the whole sort of ethos behind manifest destiny, westward the course of empire takes its way, is all grounded in an understanding that we move through the landscape and we find things in it that help give us a sense of purpose. What I also think is really important about scouting that often gets left behind in a discussion of American art is the scouting relationship to indigenous communities, the idea of building on local wisdom, of understanding the ways in which indigenous cultures in North America have taken care of the landscape, how their entire cosmology of Turtle Island is predicated on the earth being sort of a, a planet that sustains life um, in a way that a lot of white European cultures have been slow to recognize. And one of the things I appreciate about scouting is the willingness to bring in the wisdom of other cultures in order to understand how to do things better. What's really important for me about American art and American art museums is the opportunity to both give you a window into how the country developed but also to ask a lot of hard questions, particularly at this moment, about how good a job we've been doing with that information. Again, that sense of responsibility, not just um, pride in past accomplishments, and really investing an understanding of American history with a moral compass. Um, and that's something that, again, is central to scouting and to the tenets of the scouting of. Every art museum that I know in the United States is also rethinking its commitment to understanding how to present a more equitable presentation of American art and history, how to fold in indigenous arts in order to understand how that worldview um, both matters and in some cases is better calibrated to an understanding of how to treat the natural world. And what I'm looking forward to and what I hope your audience will take advantage of is in the years to come when you go visit an art museum, whether it's the ones in Michigan or whether it's in Washington or frankly anywhere else, there are really great museums, large and small, all over the country um, to really look at how we are taking seriously the responsibility, not just of telling the story of how 13 upstart colonies beat the British Empire and became a global superpower, but really, how have we treated other people along the way? How should we be treating them going forward? How do we reconcile um, these amazing landscape paintings with the way we handled Indian policy? And so it's a teaching moment. It's an opportunity to say that artists then as now are political creatures. And if you look at contemporary art, there are a lot of artists who are concerned about the state of the planet. Um, they are painting their own sort of visions and fears for what climate change will mean, what genetically modified foods mean, um, what it means to actually immerse yourself in nature and come out of it a different person. And so I think art really does comment on the state of the human condition. And what I hope that your audience can take from this is it doesn't require an advanced degree in order to have that appreciation, but it requires an open mind. And one of the things that I think scouting does particularly effectively is ask you to look beyond your comfort zone, to look beyond the familiar and to 
make a broader view so that you can be a better citizen, both of your country and of the world. Right, and we say that right in the oath and law. Um, so mm -hmm. does history have anything to tell us about the future of scouting? I would hope so. Um, I know that the scouting, whether it's the, the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts, has been doing an awful lot of soul searching lately, and I applaud that. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a lot of conversations about those things within our troop um, as, as my son was going through the scouting movement. He's 22 now. That sort of gives you a little frame mm -hmm. of reference. But I think that for me, what history has told us is that if you learn from your past, rather than feeling like you have to double down and defend or get defensive about things, you have an opportunity for real growth. And I think that it's the potential for real growth that will be the arbiter of how scouting develops in the future. Um, it's not so much even about how you redress the past, it's really about what do you learn from it? What do you commit to? What are you able to do that sends the signal that you've embraced the fact that we are all flawed, but you are finding a way to come out of it stronger and with a stronger commitment to equity and to the safety of everyone involved. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you today. I learned a lot and I, I can't wait to go visit some, some museums, maybe see some new things. And if I'm ever in DC, I will be at the Smithsonian. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I am delighted to meet you virtually. I look forward to meeting you in person. Congratulations on your own Eagle and best wishes to you in the future. Thank you so much. Before I wrap this episode, I have one last announcement to make. I'm sad to say that this is my last time hosting Scouting on Air. This August, I'm moving to Central Michigan University to begin my nursing degree, and I will no longer have an active role in Scouting on Air. I'm so grateful for the opportunities I have had to learn my new skills in broadcast journalism and share my passion for scouting with my community. I look forward to seeing this program that I help kickstart thrive and hopefully sprout up in other areas. Lastly, I want to thank my fellow crew members and our producer Brandon Kathman for being such an awesome team that started out as a handful of strangers and has grown into a small family. I hope to return someday as a guest, but for now, I'm your host Brooke Muzzy and this is Scouting on Air.